This week we look at UFH antennas, how to build them, the process and how we got here, some of the failures as well as what's next. Let's get into it. So this journey started by looking at multiple antennas for the purpose of satellite tracking in the 433 MHz band and I eventually ended up with a design you may or may not have seen in teasers that was based on a QFH antenna which is a quadrophile helical antenna and the idea is just that you have two um, wavelength or full wavelength loops wrapped around in a helical pattern. After the try the QHF antenna for the first time um, it became apparent that the dielectric effect of the plastic on the antenna had quite a big impact and I had to make a choice. Um, one was to either do away with the plastic or the second was to take advantage of the plastic and I opted for the first try to get rid of the plastic and the way by doing that was to try and use 3D printing to make a tool and what this was supposed to be and is but unfortunately doesn't work very well is a QFH antenna former but there was a big problem with this and that was when you loaded something into the actual former it would work in principle as you twist it it would actually bend the wire or the copper tube or whatever you wanted but the moment you pass the halfway point of the actual tool it would start deforming and actually pulling the cable or the conductor into the former itself so that didn't work so lesson learned very nice tool very satisfying but just doesn't work so then we went the opposite route and that was to try and make a complex helical that actually incorporated two different frequencies in the process by which I mean instead of having four um, conductors it would actually have eight and the idea was to specifically tune two, um, two in pairs to different frequencies to get the best of both worlds because the frequencies we're actually interested in is 401 megahertz as well as 437 or thereabouts and just about 5 or 10 megahertz bandwidth on both sides. That didn't work either. So what was I left to do? Well, I decided to take advantage of the dielectric constant of the plastic and actually came up with the new design. So today we'll look at building this design, what went into it and the test results of the design itself and then what's the next steps or the recommendations. So let's get into it. Right, so let's take a look at what we need to actually build this QFH antenna. So what I have here is a refrigerator tubing, it's copper, I just bought this off of Amazon and what you can see here is it's actually four millimeter, almost exactly for those American folks, 0.15 inches. And the nice thing about this copper is it's nice and flexible so you can bend it by hand. It's a necessary attribute of this material for the antenna we're making. So I just have two pieces here. They've both been cut to 800 millimeters in length. So it's just to make it easier to bit handle. They generally come in two or three meter sections. All the items that I have on or that I'm using today I'll link in the description below. Um, they can be bought off Amazon or any other supplier that you can find. Next, what we'll need is actually some coaxial RF cable. Um, again, I just got this off of Amazon. It's RG316. It's not the best for um, the frequency we're using, but it'll do at the price we got it at. So just a roll of this, I think it's... And then we need a SMA connector. So you can buy these kits. Um, off of Amazon as well. They have the little crimps, they have the inner core as well as a bit of heat shrink to put on the end and then to terminate that we require the actual crimper. So this is a RF crimper. Um, these heads can do different sizes according to the different connectors and stuff that you buy. So always a nice tool to have, not very expensive but it allows you to make custom cables at home very inexpensively. Then what you're going to need is some sort of plier. This is just a longness plier I have lying around. Um, and then obviously you need a ruler as well as, now you don't need this, you could use a hacksaw or anything like that, but I find that a Dremel does a good job of actually trimming, cutting the copper and stuff to a desired length. So we'll need it. And then last but not least is our actual little frame. So this took about eight hours to print. I printed it in two sections, not that I needed to, 
but my specific printer for some reason every time I got up to the higher stages it would shift and it would mess up the print. So I just found it easier to actually slice it in half. The files are on Fingerverse, also link in the description below. And you print it upside down and then stick it together after the fact. So without further ado, let's get building. So one of the first things you want to do is just actually grab one of your copper links. Like I mentioned, it's more or less 800 millimeters. If I measure it quickly, more or less see it's about yeah 831 inches or thereabouts we're gonna cut them a bit long because we're gonna trim them back about five or six centimeters or two inches so the first things you want to do is just grab your copper and mark the center line so that's 800 so around the 400 mark right around there it's gonna take a sharpie and actually mark the line there it's very important because this is our starting point and just to do the same on the other one, since they cut the same length, and just line up the one side and mark this one as well. Right. Next, what you want to do is actually look at the ends. Now, this has been just cut off with a um, plier. Now, of course, if this thing was cut with a Dremel in the first place, you wouldn't have this issue. So learnings for you there. So just again, just push it slightly open. And you can see the ends there. So it's just nice and round. There we go. All right. So the next things you want to do is actually grab your frame. And just mark what side is top and what side is bottom. For some people, this might be obvious, but I've, I had a lot of questions already about this frame, and I feel this is the easiest way. So the top side, well, let's start at the bottom. The bottom side actually has these four little holes. And for my specific purpose, these are the mounting posts as to how I mount the device on top of the pole. So you can decide on the STL files to change this around or find a different mounting method, the only important thing to note is whatever you mount this antenna to must just not be metallic because whatever you attach or touch to the actual copper is going to change the tuning of the antenna. So very important to note that. So what I'm going to do just for the purposes of being clear, I'm going to mark this bottom one as B and we know the top is the top. So let's get started. So what we're going to do is, is actually grab one of these and look at the bottom of our frame. And you'll notice the holes is all the way through the frame itself. Right, there you can see. So you want to root this through your frame all the way until the mark that you've just made is roughly in the middle over there somewhere. And then with very firm force, hold the opposite end of your device. So you grab it like that. And then what you want to do slowly is by applying firm pressure, but carefully is just start bending your copper tube into the frame. And what I found the best or the easiest way to keep it in place is actually to bend both sides slightly already, but we're only going to finish one side at a time. So just grab it and add a bend to it and that'll just make sure that your center line stays center in the middle of the frame so i'm just going to carry on doing this um, and i'm probably going to do this on a hyperlapse so i don't bore you guys and so there we have it and if that looks satisfying it is as every bit satisfying to bend it around this frame as it looks getting to the top. So what I have here is just a bit of painter's tape um, and don't be tempted to actually use glue at this stage. You want this to be a bit loose because we have to cut this to length and then slowly and carefully maneuver this to inside the frame. So let's go ahead and do that. Basically the next step is to make sure everything is in place. You can see our line at the bottom stayed in the center. Everything looks great. And now you want to eyeball this device because effectively we have to put a bend um, in, the in the pipe over here. But we have to cut it shorter because we have to root it through the hole 
in the center but you don't want it too short so you can't solder it for the work we need to do inside but you also don't want it too long so it's in the way of the other side the easiest way i found to do this was just to take a simple measurement of the length that we have there and it's roughly one and a half inches or four centimeters 40 millimeters um, i'm just going to go ahead and actually cut this to about to be fair let's do it four centimeters to start off with so because the bend is actually going to take some some slack out of the device so just grabbing that over there and since the device is symmetrical we can do the same for the other side all right and for this i'm going to use the dremel There we go. Be careful, these things have got sharp burrs normally, so you just want to grab something and make sure that you clean those ends off. Because, as you might have told from my fingers, I have injured myself before. So, there we go. So, now what you're going to do is actually make sure you start the bend as to where you want the bend to go and the direction like this so but you don't want to go any further because we have to actually pull it off same for the other side so just again help it through there like so and now you can grab the one side peel off the painters tape and you'll see it wants to spring out of place just hold it in place pull it a bit further away from the device and then slowly start working it into that corner And so there we have it. Just by manually carefully it and using the pliers, you can actually get it in there fairly easily. So that's in place. Now I'm just gonna repeat this for the second option. Just make sure you bend it in the inside so it's out of the way of the second one before you start this one, otherwise you're gonna be in the way. So let's get that done and then I'll start wrapping the other one. And there we have it. So two of the legs are actually been wrapped now. For these views that actually built antennas before, and specifically antennas for the SATNOG or the Tiny GS community, would notice that this antenna is actually, or looks rather small for its size. Um, and what I mean by that is it's only 200 millimeters in length or 8 inches, and it's like 2 3 inches across or 70 millimeters. Now, generally, for a four, 400 megahertz range, this would about, be about 30 or 40 percent larger. but this is actually a dielectrically loaded antenna and what i mean by that is the antenna length has been compensated for the actual plastic so the plastic has a effect on the resonant frequency of the antenna itself so by taking advantage and making the surface area that touches the antenna as large as possible i've actually been able to shrunk this antenna down to the size where it's at now this is all theoretical and it takes quite a bit of trial and error but we'll put this on the vector network analyzer and actually see where this antenna is resonating. And I'm pretty sure by the time you watch the videos, the files that you would download to build your own would be compensated if indeed some extra compensation was required. So that's why the antenna is the size it is. Anyway, so the next step now that it's in place is to add it a bit more permanently. And I found the best way to do this is actually just to use something called um, CA glue, which is a Top of a super glue with an activator and all you need to do is just put a drop in place like so push it in place and then you have an activator which is just a 
accelerant that immediately makes that glue go hard and it holds your so very useful for this type of stuff but do use it sparingly because it will actually also change the dielectric constant of your device so you can't put it all the way through to the end of your device anyway let me wrap the other side and then we can get on to the connection points and so just an important note before i forget i always get this question as well but basically when this antenna is fed through at the bottom the actual connection point for this antenna is not indeed at the bottom the antenna feed point is at the top of the antenna so the cable routes through the cable which we'll see now but what i thought was important for you to note is that the two wrappings around the antenna core does not make contact in there i hope it's visible and that spacing between the top and the bottom as well as at the top has a direct impact on each loop's resonant frequency. So very important to note that those two do not touch over there. And so there we have it. Now, I'm not gonna lie, it's not the easiest thing to do in the world, but it probably took me about 20 to 25 minutes to wrap all four cores and as well as actually tie them off. Now, this is also a confusing part for a lot of people, but basically, um, well, the tape is just here to hold the glue in place while we solder them but the way this gets connected is the cable comes up wraps around the outside forming the balen or the the current choke um, which is up for discussion but anyway it comes up comes through here and the way this gets connected is your ground or your your shield um, gets connected to a 90 degree angle and your inner core gets connected to the 90 degree angle and what you what's interesting to note or What's important to note is it is one of the short loops legs with one of the long loops legs and one of the short loops legs with one of the long loops legs. So these two will get soldered together, those two will get soldered together, and then there's a little trick with the coaxial cable as to how to allow you a bit of tunability um, to get the perfect match or the perfect impedance. So let's get on to that. Um, I'm just going to solder these two together. Just a little building trick here. Um, the soldering might look like Swiss cheese, but basically what I'm doing is, is just to make sure that the uh, 3D print doesn't actually overheat. I'm just heating up one section at a time until the solder flows between the two sections and I'm going back and forth and back and forth because copper is unfortunately a very good heat conductor as well. Um, so it heats up fairly quickly and will actually start melting the frame if you just stayed in one spot for too long. So just by holding it in place until you get a good solid weld basically between the two or flow of solder between the two and use as much flux as you want just to get that done. But you want a um, electrically sound connection between the two that won't shake loose or anything like that. So I think for our purposes that'll do. And so there we have it. So now it's ready for the coaxial cable to be installed. So just going to put that aside for now and we'll grab this now the type of cable you decide to use is highly dependent on your application as well as your um, intended installation area for me my antennas gets installed in the um, attic because i've got um Karens for neighbors so unfortunately i can't have anything outside but luckily with that is none of my stuff has to be waterproof so for me this is perfectly fine to use but one thing I will say is what I like about this antenna design, it's sturdy. Like there's no detuning or doing anything to this. So it's perfectly well suited to go outside. Just make sure that if your intended purpose is outside, that the plastic that you use has got some sort of UV rating, or you might need to spray paint the plastic before you actually put it outside just to help it protect it from the sun and the rain and cold. So a little bit of a tech tip there. All right. So the cable length doesn't really matter. Um, generally, what I would actually recommend or prefer doing is putting a connector at the bottom here. But for my purpose, I don't need that. So I'm just going with a straight length of cable that will be terminated on both ends, one directly to the antenna, as well as the other one um, to the SMA connector. So I can connect it straight to my um, tiny GS receiver. So I'm just gonna roll a few meters off of this and then cut a piece off.
there we go now before we start cleaning the ends off we have to fish this through and actually wrap the what they call the balin um, that's not really a balin um, some people argue and it'll go to the end of days but what i would agree on is that it has a benefit for a common mode choke um, which just helps the antenna avoid issues when transmitting not so much for receiving and especially not an issue if you are just using it for receiving and with your cable is very short but for the purposes of being um, thorough we will do it now part of the design which you'll see here is actually there's this inner core section that has been designed for the wrapping of it and there's a hole there and the hole above it as well so the idea is to just fish the cable past your bottom section up through the top and you have to find some sort of way of actually just pulling that cable through there first and then obviously the game of the game is just to get that through the hole which is difficult to do while staring at a camera so I'm just gonna do it like that and then I'll show you what it looks like when it gets actually get pulls through right so now I've actually caught that in the little loop and you can see from the top there is I've got it there so what you want to do now is very carefully pull back on the main cable until you reach almost at the end of your cable and start pulling and pushing at the same time and effectively what you'll see what happens is you've managed to pull that end straight through that little hole so now you want to pull a certain amount through and we can adjust that as we go along but effectively the idea now is, is to go through the device on the right hand side and wrap at least four times um, four to five times is is adequate from what i've seen so far and it's fairly simple to do so just carry on doing this until you get to the other end and then simply push it through the hole at the top that it pokes out through the top and so there we go so i've got five wraps total coming through on the bottom wrapping around the right right side and then coming through the top and all i'm going to do is just to keep that in place is use that same ca glue and cover a little bead of glue over here and probably three more places give it a spritz of activator and that should stay in place so let's go ahead and do that now i'm sure there's pretty bad other ways of keeping this in place like double-sided tape underneath i'm just working with what i have available right now and like i said because i'm actually building this for indoor purposes i'm not too worried about um, doing this in a more permanent way but feel free to come up with your own ways or modify the files where you deem fit and there we have it so that's how the cable gets installed like i said before it just fishes past the bottom there's no connection there and that's how it lives from now on so now we need to clean this table cable off and get ready for a connection now when it comes to actually ending off the cable or terminating the cable this requires a bit more of um, a steady hand and finesse because what we need to do is carefully take off the outer plastic sleeving off the ground without cutting the actual core and what i find best to do that is just one of these little blades obviously they come with a note of caution they are very sharp as my hands can contest to that so what you want to do is when you look at the top of your device you want the ability to push like an inch or so of cable back into the device and that just gives you a bit of slack to work with so make sure before you do that you push that into the device then the first things you want to do is just for my own reference take the sharpie and make a mark like i said so somewhere over there Let's try this. It's probably a bit shaky, but I'm hoping you can see what I'm doing better. Right. So what you want to do is just very, very softly with a very sharp blade, run through the outer layer of the plastic. And that is it. No more, no, nothing else. And you want to do that all the way around. And then about half a centimeter or five millimeters quarter of an inch thereabouts just do it again and then what you want to do is actually cut parallel to the cable 
just again very very softly so that you can carefully peel off the protective layer like so there you have it so that's going to be your connection point of one of the sides inside the antenna and i'll explain why this is done in such a way just now first things we're going to do is actually just tint this plugs on there and just make sure it's covered all the way around right that will add some structural strength to the cable core itself so it doesn't crash on itself um, as well as give you a point to solve that now carrying on what you want to do is about half an inch further or so um, you can always cut the shorter if you want to but around about there you probably want to you know, somewhere there about two centimeters all right don't worry about the ugliness we'll clean that up now now what you want to do is actually clean it again with your knife or your blade and this time just give yourself about five millimeters or so and what i like to do here um, to make sure that i don't cut into the inner core is actually just take these and now fray them out and backwards because we're not actually going to use this um, I just like to do that this way so I can see that the core itself is clean rather than trying to cut through the outer sleeving and this at the same time because what I find is 9 out of 10 times you actually cut further and you cut into the core um, and you can cause a short which you don't know which causes You literally need a centimeter, well, two millimeters, if that. Call it a millimeter. I don't even know what that is in inches. Sorry, folks. So grab that. I think it's a sixteenth. And all you want to do is literally just have the tip sticking out. And again, grab your solder iron. and just coat the end to make it easier. Now, so now you're ready to actually attach this to the ends of our antennas, and I'll show you how now. Okay, so staring at the top of our antenna, effectively what we want to do now is, again, like I mentioned, push this cable back inside the actual enclosure, and that's just to give us some flexibility if we mess up that we can actually take another go at it. So what you want to do is, is push your cable back down into the hole so your exposed section can match up to one of the sides of that antenna and which you want to go ahead and just solder that together now i do run the risk of burning myself here but it comes with the territory so just be careful when you do this there is a burning risk because you need to hold it in place while this is taking place so let's just get it nice and hot Never time to do it right the first time around, always the second time around. Trying to heat it up, but eventually you do get it just hot enough. Right, something like that. I hope it's visible. So that's a proper solder joint now. And effectively what we want to do now is just bend this over and solder to that side of the coin now when you solder this where you solder it on that axis changes the tuning ever so slightly so what you want to do is is actually go ahead and just tint this edge all the way along and then slowly start working your way from one end to the other end to try and find the best match often if you've built the antenna perfectly and there was no issues in the world in terms of losses or inaccuracies or anything it would most likely be right in the middle but otherwise you have that slightly amount of flexibility over there and sometimes what you even see is this length of the cable can be shortened um, to also get a better match on your vna but we'll see that when we get to that stage so i'm going to go ahead and solder this straight in the middle on that side and just like that we have a connection so just want to look around make sure that there is no shorts from 
ground core to that core and over here. And so the last thing we actually need to do is attach the SMA male connector to the other end of the cable. Now there's plenty of videos on YouTube of how to do this. And so it's important to understand that these connectors as well as the RF cables comes in many different forms, sizes with different attributes and they're designed towards specific frequency ranges. So it's always a good idea to do a bit of research and see what frequency range is best suited for the cable that you are using and the associated crimpers, the connectors all plays a part in this role. So I'm not going to go too deep into that section in this video. I'm just giving you a bit of a heads up. So you have to always take that into account and although it doesn't really make a big difference when you have short cable runs like a meter or two meters when you start running cables from outside of the house all the way to the inside 10 plus meters or 30 feet those sort of attributes starts playing a role and for the purposes of what we're doing in terms of tracking satellites every single bit helps but there you have it a quadrophile helical antenna that is ready for testing so putting it on the VNA, which is a vector to analyze it, that just tells you where the antenna is the most sensitive or the best match. It became very apparent that the antenna's bandwidth was not as wide as um, designed, but that's the nature of it. It happens. So if we look at the VNA here, we can see we have a fairly good match and we have about a 12 mega, megahertz bandwidth, which is not bad, but for 4 millimeter tube, I expected a bit more. So with a bit of tuning and going back and forth, which can take days, um, I'm hoping to get this better. But as a first result, we are in the right band and we have a very good match so far. So overall, happy with it, but we will continue and improve, innovate and... And so there we have it. Did it work? Yes, but not as good as I wanted to. I am a little disappointed, but that's the nature of antennas. The theory, the calculators, everything will only get you so far. The only way to actually get anywhere is to build, test, innovate, and adapt and overcome. And with today's technology, like 3D printers, CAD software, or I should say web-based CAD software that is freely available, anybody could do this at home. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, we will be making alterations. We will be posting some test results, probably in a short format. If you like this type of content, then I hope you will consider subscribing to the channel. If you know of a better way to do this, or if you could assist in helping of how to tune this antenna, or maybe get a better bandwidth, comment in the section below, um, hit a like, share, and let's build.